Oh, okay, great. You Thank are. you very much. Let's start Thank the you. webinar. Okay. Thank you, Joachim. Um, uh, so uh, let's go on with the slides. Uh, so, as you can see, uh, um, I am Sanna Kallio. I deal with the international business uh, here in Julia Soft. And uh, with me is uh, Pietro Ferrara, who is the head of our research and development uh, uh, area. Today, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, static analysis. Uh, I will give a very brief introduction of our company just to, so that you have an idea uh, of who we are. And then I leave uh, the word to Pietro, who will be talking about static analysis, uh, um, in particular, how uh, it is and it was used uh, in embedded areas, and uh, uh, how it is different uh, in enterprise software. Uh, then he'll also go a little bit into detail what has been changing with uh, the coming of IoT, and uh, look at ways uh, to compare static analyzers. Um, so about us, uh, Julia Soft, uh, we are um, a technology company specializing in software verification, in particular static analysis. Uh, um, we come uh, from a uh, uh, university uh, past. Uh, we uh, were originally born as a university spin-off company based on uh, uh, quite a long uh, uh, academic research into, into this, uh, this field. And uh, now, for uh, quite a few years, we have been on the markets uh, um, at first here in Italy, which is our home market, and then uh, uh, for a couple of years, we have been starting to look abroad. Since we come from research, for us, uh, um, having uh, the development uh, of the product inside the company is very important. So we have uh, our uh, research and development uh, area inside, uh, headed by Pietro, and uh, we do a lot of uh, research also in collaboration with uh, academia and, uh, and other partners. Uh, a few customers, uh, mm, typically since we specialize in the analysis of Java, uh, C Sharp and Android software, we have been working a lot uh, with um, enterprise customers, let's say financial insurance sectors, uh, where these languages are very much used, of course. Uh, in the past few years, uh, um, as I referred to, to the, the changes that the IoT is, uh, is bringing into, into companies, uh, we have also started working more with industries uh, because also industries were typically embedded, had a big role, also have a, a, a lot more enterprise software at the moment. Uh, we uh, have uh, solutions which uh, are based all on our analysis technology. Pietro will uh, uh, and say a few words about this. The analysis technology is uh, um, uh, is able to find uh, uh, is able to to do a very deep analysis of software code. What we look at in, in software are uh, issues which have to do with quality, the, let's say the classical area of static analysis. In uh, recently, security vulnerabilities have become a very big issue, of course, for companies. So this is something that we have been developing very heavily in the past few years. Privacy, especially with the GDPR, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, has brought also data breach uh, into attention and, uh, and the risks uh, which are connected to it. So um, there are also many ways in which uh, um, deep static analysis can contribute into protecting customer data. The last block on the right uh, for the area of IoT, we collaborate with uh, Gramatech, who have a product uh, called Sonar, which uh, is uh, specialized in deep analysis of embedded C and C++ languages. So together with them, we have an integrated solution to cover all the languages, uh, uh, both C, C++ and uh, Java, Android, .NET. On top of our static analysis product, we also have a, a solution for uh, KPI dashboarding. So this is something uh, more, let's say, for the management area. And that's uh, all about the company. Uh, I will leave you with Pietro, who will be talking to you about uh, deep static analysis uh, for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sanna. So yeah, as you introduced me, I'm more a technical guy. I'm heading the research and development lab. I came from an academic background, so with the PhD in computer science and static analysis in particular. So what I would like to do today in the next, let's say, half an hour, is to drive you through a bit about the history, the current application, and the future of uh, 
software development and in particular of the application of software of static analysis to software development. So I want to start from the very basics and let's say, okay, this talk is about IoT, but let's start from the T, from the things. So the old fashioned world in which we had, let's say, disconnected things, disconnected devices. So first of all, what is embedded software? Embedded software is a program, a piece of software that is running on a thing, on a device, in order to control it. So embedded software deals with the physical world. It can read data from the physical world through sensors, and it can also act in the physical world through actuators. Of course, this is, let's say, a world that started about half a century ago, and it had huge applications uh, in more or less all kinds of electronic devices you can imagine. So, you know, in cars, telephones, modems, robots, and uh, so on and so forth. In this world, what we have is that the software is running in a device, in a device that is aiming to do other things, not to execute software. So you have really strict, rigid constraints in terms of memory and the computational power. So the hardware is fixed, it's not like the hardware we have on our you know, computers. And also the software needs usually to be real time, needs to be responsive if it sees that the physical world is changing some ways. Maybe, I don't know, the temperature is raising up, you want to switch on the air conditioning system in a server room, for instance. For all these reasons, and also because this world started in the old days, the main programming languages that have been used to develop uh, embedded software are, I would call them low-level programming languages, where by low level I mean that they have a lower abstraction level of the machine. So, you know, programming languages like C, C++, in which you have direct pointers to the memory and you have to unlock and free the memory manually, have been uh, widely applied here, as well, of course, as assembly code. There is also a small portion with other programming languages, but definitely these are, let's say, the big players for embedded software. Among the embedded software, I want to focus on the safety critical embedded software. What do I mean, or better, what do Wikipedia mean by safety critical embedded software? Essentially, it's a software whose failure might cause serious injuries, might kill people, serious injuries to people or damages, physical damages to the environment, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine that in this field, it's very important to have tools that are able to detect potential bugs on the program. And there are very, very strict quality requirements for this type of software. You know, a flight controller, a software controlling the flight of an airplane, as we have seen recently, might uh, cause uh, disasters. Uh, therefore, you have standards and regulations that impose really to spend quite a lot of time to debug these kind of uh, programs. Therefore, there is a very important fraction of development cost that is focused towards testing and, uh, and validation. Also, in this case, what we are looking for are bugs. What I mean by a bug? I mean, a problem in the program that if something bad happens, well, the program crashes or it starts to behave in an unpredictable way. So, for instance, memory safety violation, like you have a pointer and you access a memory, an area of the memory that was not previously allocated, so you get buffer overflows or underruns, or problems when you have multiple threads communicating each other, so things like race conditions or deadlock, as well as problems with the numerical computations, floating point approximations, for instance. Here, there is a small picture of an explosion. This is the Ariane 5 rocket that about 20 years ago exploded because a floating point approximation problem inside the software that led the program to say, I'm out of control. And at that point, the rocket was self-destructed just because of a bug. Now it's time to talk a bit about static program analysis. So first of all, what is program analysis? What do I mean by program analysis? I mean a process, in particular a tool, that automatically analyzes a program. You give a program to this tool and you get back some feedback. 
some feedback regarding specific properties. So the defi definition you have in Wikipedia is quite academic. You are talking about correctness, robustness, safety, and lightness. Making it more practical, you can think about uh, detecting null pointer exceptions, uh, buffer overruns, uh, data races, or um, numerical overflows, and so on. In this world, we have uh, two, let's say, big sub worlds. Dynamic program analysis is something I think we have all done since the first day we wrote the program. I have a program, I run it, so I have to feed some specific exact inputs to the program, and then I check how it behaves at runtime. So I give it, I don't know, some numbers and I see if it crashes. So this is called testing, in a more generic way it's called the dynamic program analysis, that is a form of program analysis that is done by running the program. On the other hand, this is what we are doing at Julia Software, there is a static program analysis. That is, I look to the program, I create a model of the program without executing it, and upon this model, I try to prove some properties. Here, the advantage we have is that we can traverse and look to the whole program without needing any specific input. While with the testing, you need to fit specific input. So in order to cover all possible executions, and we know this is not possible in the general case, we need to feed a lot of different uh, inputs that we should know in advance and that we don't know. So the coverage usually of static program analysis is quite wider, bigger than dynamic program analysis. On the other hand, because you need some ways of abstract reasoning on the program, you have false alarms that are reports by the tool that says, look, this program might be wrong, but indeed it's not because we have these forms of approximations in order to cover all the possible paths of the program. On the other hand, when you run a test and the test crashes, you are sure that you have a problem and you have very specific inputs that discover it. So what's the interface of a strategic program analyzer? Well, first of all, we need the two inputs, the program and the properties we want to check on the program. So if we are talking about security, we talk about SQL injection. If we, we are talking about more reliability issue, we talk about, I don't know, division by zero, buffer overrun. Then we feed them to a static program analyzer. So first point is that the program analyzer should be able to understand the programming language in which the software is written and the properties you want to check. And at the end of the analysis, what you get at the lowest level is a, let's say, a bunch of warnings like a compiler does. What is a warning? It's a message on a specific program point, line of code, telling you that that, line of co that specific line of code with respect to one of the properties you wanted to prove, there might be a problem, like an SQL injection, a division by zero, or other problems based on the properties you ask to the static program analyzer. Then at the end, we also need to read the result of the analysis. So we have a set of warnings. These warnings might be true positive or false positive. So what I mean by true positive, I mean the program is bagged, contains an error, and we get a warning to the line of code that contains that error. That's the ideal situation. A false positive instead is a warning, something I already told you, that refers to a line of the code that indeed is totally safe, but because of some abstractions in the reasoning of the static program analyzer, we get this false alarm. We might have also false negatives, and these are quite common in testing. What is a false negative? Well, there is a line of the code that is bugged that might uh, perform a division by zero, but uh, this is missed by the tool that we are using. Then using these numbers, we can get uh, two main uh, measures about uh, the result of the analysis. The first one is the coverage. That is the percentage of uh, the errors that were found by the tool that ran the analysis. And the second one is the precision. That is the percentage of the warnings that indeed refers to real problems. And then based on this, you can compute an efficiency score that tells you how much, let's say, how much good the tool is. And then starting from that, you can plot this and also compare different tools, in particular putting, uh, for instance, in this case on the x-axis, the percentage of the false alarms, and on the, on the y-axis, the percentage of the errors found. So the higher a tool scores, the more coverage you have, and the more the tool is on the left, the more precise the tool is. Let's go back for a bit now to the embedded software world. As I was saying, we have really strict requirements there about the quality of the software. 
And therefore, here we got uh, over the last decade a lot of different certification standard guidelines, like the Ministry of CNC++ guidelines for cars, that uh, suggest or imposes the use of static program analyzers and also of some specific uh, kinds of static program analyzers. Why? Well, because not all static program analyzers are the same. Essentially, there are two very big families of static program analyzers. The first one, I call it the syntactic program analyzers. These analyzers are looking to small pieces of code of the program you want to analyze in isolation. For instance, you have the abstract syntax tree of a method or maybe of just one statement. And you want to prove a property just by looking to this small piece. On the other hand, we have semantic static program analyzers like the Julia static analyzer or grammatic code sonar that have some very complicated models about the possible executions of the program. And these models also abstract the model how different program components, functions, procedures, methods might interact each other also through shared memory and uh, in other ways. So of course, they have both uh, some uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the syntactic tools usually are very efficient. You are really just looking to small pieces of code. You have rules that can be expressed more or less using regular expressions or this kind of uh, languages. And so you can run the analysis very quickly on a huge code base. On the other hand, uh, they, since they have this local reasoning, then they have to be tuned to achieve a decent trade-off between coverage and precision. Because, you know, you might report all the time you are dividing a number, okay? And just say, look, this might be a division by zero. But of course, this is not very, very useful. Then you might start to say, okay, it's more useful if I have a division by something where I know that the something is always the constant at zero. But probably you will be definitely precise, 100% precise, but you will miss the most part of the problems. So here, since you have this local reasoning, it's quite harder to have a decent compromise between the two axes. On the other hand, we have the semantic analyzers that can achieve very high coverage, 100% coverage in some specific cases. They perform a deep analysis, and through this deep analysis, they can give you feedback, specific feedbacks. For instance, they might say, look, we might have a division by zero at this program point because we see that you are dividing by a number that was computed a few lines above, and this number was the result of this computation that might be zero. On the other hand, since we have this very complex reasoning, semantic static analyzers require time and resources, and they might produce false alarms in particular when they want to push 100% coverage. So semantic static analysis has been quite widely applied to embedded software. Of course, focusing on uh, runtime errors, uh, like null pointed references, buffer overruns, uh, uh, division by zero, uh, numerical overflows. And they were targeting uh, as a goal to prove the absence of runtime errors, rather than finding as many bugs uh, as quickly as possible. Why? Because we have this world of uh, safety critical embedded software where the coverage is much more important than the precision. If you spend hours looking to hundreds of false alarms, but you find at the end one bug that may, I, might have been causing uh, the crash of the program and, for instance, the explosion of a rocket, the investment is well paid. And here we have many specialized providers like a Grammatic a Code Sonar. So, First part of the talk is done. Now I want to jump to the other end of the IoT world. Uh, I call it IoT backend, business application. Well, what I want to tell you here, I'm talking about, uh, in general, software that might be application, enterprise, cloud, or web software. In general, this is a software that is aiming at performing some functions. This ranges from, you know, your office suite on your laptop that allows you to write a document, Excel spreadsheet rather than emails, to a calculator, to your online e-banking, and this kind of tools. So here it's totally different from the embedded software. We don't have a piece of software that is interacting with the physical world. We have a piece of core software that is running on a computer and is performing some function, giving you some functionalities to, you know, improve your work, have fun, or make a bank transactions. 
So we are just talking about involving running the computer. And here, the programming languages that are used for this type of software are very diversified. So historically, and the most part is written in Java and C Sharp, that are the languages that the Julia Static Analyzer target. But we have also, for instance, PHP for web backend. And for the front end, we have C Sharp and the Java libraries to develop UI, but also you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So of course, uh, also in this world, the static analysis has been uh, applied during the last uh, at least uh, two or three decades. Here there is a recent paper uh, published by, pe by people working at Google in which they explain how they have been using static program analysis in their uh, life cycle, in their software development life cycle. What are the criteria that Google uses in order to say, look, let's use this static program analyzer? Well, we want to have warnings that are understandable, actionable, and easy to fix. So we want to have a feedback such that the developer is able to quickly review this feedback and take action. They want also a feedback that produces less than 10% of false positives. So the precision has to be above 90%. This is a very strict and well-defined metric. On the other hand, there is not, nothing about coverage. They are not saying we want to cover at least 80% of the back. They just put a very vague statement about saying, look, we want to have an impact on uh, improving the quality of uh, our software. So this is uh, an approach that has been uh, quite uh, uh, popular for this type of software until, let's say, a few years ago. We have software that is bugged. We know that this software contains bug, we are not so worried because a bug in the software, in the worst case, might cause you know, a blue screen in your Windows machine, for instance, but it's not going to kill people, crash a plane, or these kind of things. However, things changed during the last, I would say, decade. We started to have web software, hackers exploiting remotely problems in the software in order to take some advantage. So we started to have injections, SQL injections in particular, and nowadays also other forms of injection like command injection. So an SQL injection, what you can do is essentially to read the data in a database, write whatever you would like on the database, drop tables. And you can imagine that if you're doing this on your laptop, laptop inside, I don't know, your uh, office suite, well, you know, you are just damaging yourself who cares. But if you are doing an injection on your online e-banking, you might be able to read all the transactions made by customers of the bank. You might insert transactions, so create some fake wires, and you can also drop tables. And then we have also cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting has been used quite a lot by hackers in order to steal usually credentials from users. So, this is not going to kill people, but this is going to create, uh, have a business impact. So if you just Google for this kind of issues, you can find uh, many, many uh, cases in which an injection or a cross-site scripting vulnerability have been used by hackers in order to compromise the cybersecurity of different web services. Therefore, nowadays we have HOWASP, that is definitely the biggest institution about web security that uh, created uh, the first time about 10 years ago a list uh, of the 10 most let's say worrying uh, security vulnerabilities that might be contained in web software i'm not going much into the details of what these uh, items means what i want to push here is that then static program analysis since it's aiming at improving uh, the quality so also the security of the code since uh, we have finally a community that is looking to some uh, specific and also quite complex uh, vulnerabilities, the static program analyzer started to build up analysis to cover as many as possible of the issues listed in the OS top 10. Of course, not all the issues are covered in the same way. In some cases, like for injection and cross-site scripting, static program analyzer can achieve extremely high coverage. In some other cases, they can check only some corner cases. So what have been the situation for static analyzers when applied to application, enterprise, cloud, or web software? Well, this type of analyzer, historically, so I would say until at least a decade ago, they were 
focused on finding as many bugs as quickly as possible. So precision, much more important than coverage. This software contains quite a lot of bugs. We are aware of that and we can live well, even if it contains bugs and we can release this software. Therefore, what we have in historically in the market is many static analyzers that perform mostly syntactic checks. Cyber attacks and cybersecurity hackers changed this scenario. So a lot of damages were created exploiting security vulnerabilities. And in order to detect this type of vulnerabilities, you need to have deeper, so semantic static analyzers. So nowadays, we have many technologies on the market, on the market of, of this software. But of course, uh, only very few of them are semantics. And the Julia static analyzer is one of them. So just going back to our IoT view of the world, we had these two worlds very far away, and then the IoT, let's say, revolution is happening. And what do I mean here for the purposes of this talk about by IoT revolution? Well, we had the things, we had the cloud services, now we have things that are connected, Internet of Things, and they are connected maybe locally through a local gateway with some edge software that coordinates different devices, but also to the cloud. And from the cloud, users can interact with their IoT devices. So we have many layers. We have a layer that physically interacts with the components. This is embedded software, what I talked at the beginning of the talk. On the other hand, we have cloud services, mobile software. That is what I just talked to you about. And in the middle, we might have another layer of software in which, so let's call it edge software, that is executed on local gateway. This type of software is a bit in the middle also in terms of programming languages that are used. used. You have Android Things, for instance, that provides you a platform to develop uh, Edge software, but there are also other solutions for C++, C++ and also to write uh, in Python and other languages. However, what is very important to understand is that all the software layers at the end potentially interact with the physical components. Therefore, a vulnerability in any layer might become might have an impact on the physical world so all the layers in this new view become safety critical and more importantly also before we were just looking to attackers compromising a web service and the bugs making embedded software crashing now we might have an attacker that tried to compromise an iot system remotely having also a physical impact what do I mean by this? Here I have an example. So this example is the backing Wemo SQL injection. So it's a smart plug that you can switch on off remotely through your mobile application. So some researchers at EVC Labs, they have tried to hack the system. What they found out is that the local database in the mobile phone can be injected with the arbitrary commands. These arbitrary commands are the, were then transmitted to the smart plug that received them as granted. It was not checking that the commands were fine. So essentially, an attacker could just exploit this command to run a shell command on the smart plug, and through the script that is executing on the uh, smart plug, can gain root privileges without having any right to do this. So the vulnerability was found in August 2016, and there was a fix in November 2016. However, the fix means that you need to update the firmware of your smart plug. So here we have an attack that it might be very dangerous and this fix is not easy at all because uh, I think none or I would say at least 95% of the customers of smart plugs never update the firmware in the smart plug. So because of this situation, the OWASP moved also into the IoT world. So now we have an IoT top 10 list of security vulnerabilities. That uh, is paired in some cases with the OWASP top 10. So the one about web software, you should not use uh, insecure outdated components. You should be careful about uh, sensitive data exposure. And then we have uh, a vulnerability about insecure ecosystem interfaces. That is exactly what I was telling you. If any of the layer contains a security vulnerability, like in the case of the smart plug, the mobile application, this might uh, compromise the overall security of the system. So all the layers need to be checked uh, together. And this essentially translates, for instance, to issues about injection and uh, cross-site scripting. So here, there are new challenges uh, for uh, static analyzers. 
We have several static analyzers that have been applied both to application and embedded software. You need a unique solutions for an IoT system. That means you have layers written in different programming languages. Each layer interacts with other layers. The user input, that is the one causing potentially injection and cross-site scripting attacks, might flow between these layers. And you can discover this type of vulnerabilities only when you consider the overall IoT system. What this means for us is that uh, we have these layers. We have a solution for the IoT backend. Let's call it IoT backend, that is the Julia Static Analyzer. There are other tools, in particular, Grammatech called Sonar, that is targeting the embedded software. And we are providing a unique solution to check the overall security of your system. Now, a big question is about which analyzer should you use? What's the selection criteria? I already told you about how you can evaluate the precision and coverage. Based on these ideas, for instance, OWASP created a project, uh, the OWASP benchmark project, uh, that contains 2,700, about 2,700 Java test cases, that some of them are vulnerable, some of them are not. So what they are doing is just to take a bunch of tools, run these tools, measure coverage and precision, and then creating the plot I already showed you. So for instance, here you can see the report of this benchmark, and you can see that, uh, okay, in our case, since we are based on the semantic static analysis, we are able to gain full coverage in this benchmark with about 10% of false alarms. That is a, a precision that is more or less also what Google is asking for their own software. The other tools that are all based, most of all of them based on syntactic reasoning, at best, they can find, they can achieve almost full coverage, but producing 60% of false alarms. But then when you go down, like even tools very popular like SonarCube, they can find still like half of the errors with the 20% of false alarms. And this is the problem I was telling you about syntactic uh, static analyzers. They need to find a compromise between the precision and coverage since they don't have a global view of the program. So how we achieve this is thanks to this very deep uh, semantic static analysis technology. With this technology, we can analyze uh, bytecode, so JAR class files for Java and uh, DLL exec files for C Sharp and the .NET world. We run some very complex mathematical models based on the absent interpretation theory. I could keep you talking about this theory for hours, but this is not the focus of this talk. But this theory allows us to build up uh, a very complete model of uh, the possible executions of the program and to verify all the possible execution paths. And this leads to the results I showed you on the OWASP benchmark. Of course, this is the, let's say, low level technology we have, the very technical deep technology. Based on that, we built a comprehensive range of checkers. So some of them are focusing quality issues like uh, nullness issues or class cast in Java. Some of them are also uh, targeting uh, security uh, issues like uh, use of insecure cookie, weak cryptography, rather than injection, and cross-site scripting. We are also compatible with the different standards, so we are CWE compatible, we export our results in the SARIF format, and also all our warnings are referring to the standards of this world, like the OWASP top 10, we can tell you, look, I have an injection warning, and injection warning is the most worrying uh, security vulnerability for the OWASP top 10. So you should really take care of this. And of course, each checker applies, let's say, quite a lot of different rules. So the injection checker, this is just a laundry list of the warnings produced by the injection checker, checks from the SQL injection to the command injection, but also cross-site scripting, cross scripting issues. How you apply static program analyzers in the software development lifecycle? In what stages? Well, at the beginning, you don't have code. When you are planning, analyzing, and designing the system, you don't have code. So you cannot do program analysis without the program. As soon as you start to implement it, you can use these tools. And this is usually what we suggest to our customers. Use static program analysis as soon as possible during the development of your system. Why? Because you have developers that are writing their code. As soon as they wrote something, they can compile it, run the analysis, and get immediate feedback, and fix uh, potential bugs uh, as soon as possible. So for this reason, Julia provides uh, many plugins for different IDEs, like Eclipse, IntelliJ IDEA, Android Studio, and uh, Visual Studio, in order to allow developers to run the analysis and see the result. 
Then in a continuous integration system, when the code is pushed to a common repository, you can start cite some safeguards to see if the score, the quality score, the security score, or there are new warnings about I don't know, injection, then you can decide what to do, alert the developer or ask him to fix the, the problem. During testing the integration, so when you integrate all the system together, you can have very deep code review. So here, what we have is a check line that allows you to run the analysis from a command line. So you can integrate it, for instance, in Jenkins, in Jira, and this kind of continuous integration systems. And finally, you want to see how the software evolves over time and how different projects of your software behaves. And then we have a very uh, wide uh, system of dashboards that allows you to have an extremely high level view of your software, just a number, a quality score, a security score, down to views like uh, with respect to the OWASP top 10 or the CVSS issues. And so like even a manager that maybe has no knowledge about the software, maybe even no knowledge about programming languages, can have a very high level view of the system and take actions, take decisions based on this dashboard. So this more or less ends the technical part of uh, the talk. Now, what's next? Well, something you can do as soon as uh, you disconnect from this call is just to go to portal.juliasoft.com, register your new user, then you get credentials. With these credentials, you can log in. You get about 10,000 lines of code to uh, analyze for free. Here you have a quick start that allows you in a few minutes to install an IDE plugin and run your first analysis. And then I can switch uh, to Eclipse. So with our IDE plugin for Eclipse, you can just set the preferences of your account and run an analysis saying, look, I want to analyze this program with some standard options that you don't need to care about using this checker. So usually we just run the basic checker. So as soon as you push finish, you get an estimate of how much credits that you are paying. And then what happens is that your program is, so the bytecode of your program is uploaded to the cloud. It's uploaded to the cloud and the analysis is queued to our cloud services. So usually our cloud services after a few minutes, they take care of running the analysis. And so you get soon the result of your analysis inside your plugin and you can inspect them. So for instance, you can just jump to one of the warnings and this warning tells you, look, the receiver of metal length might be null. Why? Because I'm seeing that you are comparing against null a few lines above. So here we are at line 20. We have at line 17 a check if K1 is equals to null and K2 is equals to null, then you do something. Otherwise you just do K1 dot length. But of course here K1 might be null because if K2 is not null, but K1 is null, you can still reach this branch when K1 is not. So you can start to have, let's say, fun with this uh, type of, uh, of analysis immediately after the call. Or, or, sorry, I just went to the wrong slide. And, uh, or what else you can do? And I leave back the speech to Sanna. <laughs> Thank you, Pietro. <laughs> um, so, um, since uh, uh, what um, uh, Pietro has been uh, been telling us is uh, um, the difference between uh, different kinds of static analyzers, um, I believe uh, a lot of you are already using something, um, and uh, and anyway are familiar with them. Um, uh, uh, what uh, we um, invite you to do, if uh, you would be interested in, um, um, in in trying to see if uh, the type of technology uh, applying a deeper approach, a semantic approach, can actually find uh, something in your software that uh, perhaps your current tools are not finding. Um, uh, uh, the easiest thing, uh, if you are interested in uh, seeing how the uh, Juliasoft technology works. Uh, we are doing a second webinar uh, next Friday, same time. Um, and uh, in that uh, occasion, uh, Pietro will be actually showing you how the analyzer works. And also we'll be looking at uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, vulnerabilities uh, which uh, are actually found inside the code and uh, and uh, also to see uh, in which way you can uh, uh, you can decide and configure uh, an analysis in order to find uh, different kinds of, uh, of problems and vulnerabilities. Um, also a second uh, option that uh, of course you have 
since uh, uh, the webinar we are doing today is in collaboration with uh, our distributor for Scandinavia know-how. Um, uh, it is uh, um, also, of course, possible if you want to set up an evaluation. Um, uh, normally, in an evaluation, uh, the, our customers uh, uh, select uh, some uh, software, some of their own software, and uh, we and uh, know how support uh, them in, uh, in doing a first analysis. Uh, this way, you can actually um, uh, analyze the real application that you have. Um, this is uh, all from our part today. And um, I would uh, uh, ask uh, if uh, anybody has questions uh, on uh, any of the contents.